Thanks to all our media members for joining us today. As a reminder, please use the raise hand function if you do have a question. We'll go ahead and get started with Rob Hunt, Director of Athletic Training and Rehabilitative Services and Head Athletic Trainer for Football. We'll make an opening statement and then we'll have the opportunity for three questions. So Rob, if you'd like to go ahead and start us off. Thanks, Claire. Um, just an update and kind of where we're at from our uh, outbreak from last week. Currently we have 18 players in isolation and 11 players, players in quarantine. 11, 11 players in quarantine. Nine players have been released in the last two days, have left have quarantine, quarantine and isolation, isolation, and 14 more will leave in the next two days. Um, our Monday surveillance test uh, had zero positives, and our Wednesday surveillance test had zero positives. Our next uh, date to test will be on Friday. Uh, it'll be another full team test as previously scheduled. Uh, players that are in um, quarantine as a close contact, as a contact, contact follow a day four and day seven testing regimen, uh, which mirrors its uh, uh, university policy. Um, a negative day seven test allows them to begin an exercise regimen and allows them to attend class per university policy. Players in isolation um, have no activity for 10 days, a uh, minimum of 10 days. Uh, our medical staff has direct communication with all of our players in quarantine and isolation and are also contacted by the university care team um, on, a on a regular basis. basis. Currently, we've had no hospitalizations. Uh, the majority of our players that have, have had mild to moderate symptoms and uh, have done very well from a recovery process. Um, how do we get to where we were? We had, uh, we had seven positives on Monday the 21st, which forced us to pause all football activities. Um, we followed our regular testing and we put out a release in terms of what our testing was last week. Ended up with uh, 25 positive tests last week uh, from that outbreak and forced us to review all of our systems. Um, I think we've done a thorough review in terms of where that's at um, with the help of Mark Fox, um, our contact tracing team, Heather Christofferson, Mike Seaman, uh, Dr. Leisler, all of our operations staff, and have looked um, deeply into kind of where we're at and where, how do we get to where we were. Um, focused on locker room, housing, meals, um, looked at our hotel operations, any field activities, we reviewed film and tried to kind of isolate and contact, figure out what, where, our, where our issues were. Um, and so currently with the last uh, two tests being negative, today will be our first day back to uh, a football practice activity. We have had conditioning activities um, twice this week, uh, once as a voluntary activity and once as a team activity. Um, so far, those have gone well. So with that, um, I'll leave that kind of where we're at currently and uh, open it up for what questions we may have here. All right, we'll start it off with Pete Sampson of The Athletic. Uh, Rob, I had a, a couple. One was if you could explain if you're in isolation as a positive test, what sort of the ramp up back to activity is after 10 days. And then also, as you look back at sort of the outbreak from the, the team dinner that Brian Kelly talked about, do you see that as more a byproduct of uh, protocol uh, protocol be adjusted, be adjusted. Or so players doing a better job of following the ones that were already in place good yeah first i'll talk about our isolation so 10 days of isolation is is the minimum time uh, they have to uh clear through that 10-day period once they leave that 10-day period um, as long as they're asymptomatic on the back end of that they're released out of isolation their first day out, um, we go through our cardiac screening process, um, includes EKG, lab work, um, echocardiogram, and uh, that's, then, that's then moved to by wow. Dr. Kovacs, who's a cardiologist out of Indianapolis with IU Health. Um, his team then reviews all those and gives us the okay to um, begin a kind of slow, progressive um, activity regimen the first day post clearance uh, may include 20 to 30 minutes worth of cardiovascular exercise, and that's about it. Um, if that goes well, we'll 
begin some on the field activity at maybe 50% of what they would be their previous total. If that goes well, we progress to 70%, maybe 75%, um, and then ease them back into that 100% competitive, full competitive practice uh, prior to being released to full, full activity. Um, relative to kind of our review, um, you know, we looked at everything. Certainly our meal may have been a part of that. Um, I think there's probably some other opportunities for us to look at what we were doing and, and determine that there's probably some areas that we were loose um, in, in maintaining kind of the strict disciplined approach to what we were doing. Um, you know, I think there's a component of our testing regimen makes people feel um, comfortable with a negative test. And I think what we're realizing in this current situation is that a negative test on, on Friday doesn't necessarily mean that you're completely negative from the standpoint of clearing, like you, sh you should, should maintain the protocols that are clearly established. And I think we may have gotten a little loose in some areas in terms of how we operate within our locker room, um, in, in terms of our mass compliance, um, just our, our spacing on the sidelines and the activities that are being done there. And these are certainly speculative, but as we kind of look at the clusters that we had and the, the position groups that they were um, and how, the, how we contract trace the spread, um, there were areas that we can get better. But it, you know, a negative test doesn't mean that you're uh, uh, necessarily free and clear from the virus at that point. And uh, it just might mean you had a viral load that was low enough that didn't test positive. So um, we're gonna tighten those pieces up and uh, kind of strict adherence to the policies and procedures that we had prior to this outbreak. You know, prior to uh, September, I think we had 12 or 13 positives off the top of my head leading into the start of the season. And uh, now we're looking at, you know, 30, 30 positives in the month of- Done uh, the right way. In the month of September. So a um, little bit, a little bit of a, certainly part of it's that cluster outbreak, um, but we need to get back to the detailed work that we, that we had prior. All right, we'll move next to Eric Hansen of the South Bend Tribune. Hi, Rob, um, a two-parter here. Is there a concern about players mixing with family and friends after games, particularly with those who've traveled long distances? And does evolving to a daily testing model for the entire roster makes sense at this point? Yeah, relative to the players and family, that was one of my biggest concerns prior to the start of the season. Um, you know, it was a, an area that that was a new group of people that we were bringing into our um, kind of our tight knit group. Um, you know, the word bubbles probably not, it, it's often overused. I think the only bubble that's actually out there is the NBA, um, but certainly our, our closed environment um, we're bringing people from the outside. Um, looking back now over the last two weeks or the last two games that we had, I'm not sure that the families were in any part of that source or, or part of that cause of, of where we're at today. Um, certainly it's a possibility, but as our contact tracing teams have dug deep into this, it, it, you know, none of the families were symptomatic pre or post, and uh, it doesn't appear that any of them have contracted the illness from our players either. So I, I'm not sure that that's a, a reasonable explanation. It's an easy one. It's an easy one to say that that's the problem, but it, you know, it's probably not reality in terms of what we're doing there. Relative to the testing regimen, I, I like our testing regimen right now. Certainly daily testing may be a piece that we end up, um, end up at, but I know that that's um, beyond where I'm at in terms of that's Dr. Fox and, and Dr. Leiser. I know Dr. Fox, as we met last week, was very comfortable with our three-day-a-week PCR testing. Um, and, and we do have some overlay with some of our, we have some select players throughout the week that we are testing daily with, with antigen testing that's available here through the university. Um, so we've got a little bit of a blend of everything there. And uh, so far, you know, on the backside of this cluster outbreak, I feel pretty good about where we're at with our testing. All right, and we will wrap it up with Tim Priester of Irish Illustrated. Rob, um, 
I apologize if I'm not hearing this correctly, but you're you're talking about the the positive tests on Monday after South Florida. What connection is, if there is any, uh, was there to the? I believe it was seven players that were held out of the South Florida game. Uh, good question. You know, as we looked at uh, names and numbers and and those kinds of things, and then our operations before and after uh, around that. You know, one one component of that um, potentially was a was our was our meal, and uh, you know our our meal process was socially distant in a room. But as we kind of trace it out within the room um, post, as we look at as you overlay all of your positives into that environment, there there was a area of the room that appeared to be a little bit more higher higher positives in that area. So I think that gives a little bit of insight in terms of how it was, but our, you know, we had our MAKO test on Friday, or which is the ACC testing on Friday, um, had two positives uh, that day, which held them out from the game, which then required us to contact Trace on Saturday morning. And you're trying to kind of contain what that looked like. Um, we believed we had most of it, and uh, there's a possibility that some of that contact tracing may not have grabbed all those people uh, with regards to those positive tests from the Friday uh, afternoon test um, is, is the only only component there. It's, it's speculative. It's a guess, um, but it's an educated guess that allowed um, some of those guys to uh, then test positive on Monday. All of them had a negative test, obviously, on Friday. Um, but it certainly shows a source of, of potential concern for us as we move forward. And we've made, you know, similar changes. We're going to space out our, what was a socially distant environment. Sorry about that. Uh, I muted myself there. We're going to, you know, we've spaced out our, our meal even farther than the socially distant component that we had. So we're gonna even be broader. Uh, we're we're de-densifying our locker room um, even more than what we had previously done. What we had used before was a shifted approach to the use of the locker room. So it's it's now a shifted locker room um, schedule as well as a de-densified locker room. We're gonna spread out more on the sidelines with regards to chairs and benches and uh, really, really dig deep and hold our players um, into a, a kind of a zero tolerance with regards to mass, mask usage moving forward. So those are the areas that we've identified to try to help ourselves prevent this from happening again and uh, so that our guys continue to move forward through the season. They've done a great job through this. Um, they've worked really hard over the last week to get this thing under control. And uh, I think we've got you know, we've got one foot on the brake a little bit still, but uh, I think all of us feel a lot better about where we're at now relative to 10 days ago. All right, thank you very much, Rob, for your time. We will go ahead and move to Coach Kelly. So if you do have a question for Coach Kelly, please go ahead and use that raise hand function. And Coach, if you're ready, we will go ahead and get started with John Finneran of the Associated Press. Good morning, Brian. I was wondering I'm if done. perhaps uh, when you were uh, uh, backtracing and trying to find out, uh, is there a possibility that some uh, that maybe the uh, someone who was uh, serving the pregame meal or anybody who was involved in serving it might have had uh, might have had something that uh, it caused this caused the outbreak. Yeah, I mean we've looked at <clears throat> all situations, uh, staff, and and uh, certainly uh, you know from our perspective, we think we've uh, examined all the things that we feel as though could have uh, impacted. Uh, so, yeah, that's been part of our process in terms of examining the staff as well. So. Um, as as Rob mentioned, uh, we've changed up our uh, pregame meal uh, scenario. We're going to be uh, uh, using another facility across the street that gives us uh, much more room um, and and allows us to, uh, you know, again socially distance, but also um, from from a meal preparation standpoint, um, 
control it uh, to our liking. So yeah, we've examined everything. We'll next move to Pete Byrne of WSBT. And Pete, I believe your microphone is muted. I apologize. Can you hear me now, Coach? Yeah, sure can. Hey, thanks. Uh, I know that you guys don't identify specific individuals that test positive, but I'm curious if you could tell me of the roughly 39 guys you've had sidelined since last Monday, approximately how many of those guys are either starters or players that would contribute for you regularly in a game. And mm -hmm. while you hope to be moving in the correct direction, how many more setbacks do you think you guys could afford over the next week and still be ready to play against Florida State? Uh, we're we're going to be able to prepare the football team uh, to play Florida State. Uh, so I, I think in terms of uh, identifying uh, who is uh, available, who's not available, uh, again, it's, it's an exercise that we're not going to get into other than the, I can tell you this, that uh, – we have modified our schedule to, um, to, to make certain that uh, we're, we're taking care of our guys first in terms of their health. And then secondly, preparing in a manner that allows us to get our entire football team back intact. Look, I've been doing it for 30 years. I, I know how to get individuals back um, after an injury or a guy that's been away from the game for a couple of weeks and and, and they've done pretty good. I, I think you look at, you know, Dexter Williams didn't play for, I think, a month, and he had a pretty good game against Stanford. Um, I, I can give you a lot of examples. The difference here is that we've got to bring the whole team back. And so it's important that we're extremely um, strategic in the way that we uh, practice and, and when we practice. So getting the whole group back uh, together – is very, very important. So uh, when and how we practice, you can be assured that the timing of this um, is being calculated as to uh, when we practice and, and how we practice. Uh, because we have to be ready for Florida State. And uh, relative to setbacks, we can't afford another setback the way we had one th this past um, past 10 days. So uh, everybody's aware of that. Um, we know that we have uh, uh, no wiggle room for the kind of setback that, that we had. And, you know, we'll see if it's a setback or, or a pause and uh, how we play against Florida State will, will be the narrative that, that everybody writes relative to this either being a pause and dealing with, uh, with COVID and the realities of it or um, it was a, a major setback. We'll move next to Ralph Russo, the Associated Press. Hey, Brian. Um, I'm just going to follow up from where you left off there uh, when you talk about getting practices scheduled and things along those lines. Well, actually, let, let, me, let me take it back one, more, one step a little farther. You haven't really been able to do anything, so how are you keeping kids, kids players engaged uh, things you can do physically with the players who aren't quarantined and aren't in isolation. What's been the the engagement with the team over the last week or so to keep to keep guys sharp? Well, everybody that's in quarantine, we have a modified quarantine program that we've established throughout the summer, and that has been in effect. So if you're in quarantine, not isolation, and isolation versus quarantine is isolation. Obviously, you have COVID. Uh, you are not doing any kind of uh, conditioning activity. Uh, once you test out of, um, you know, uh, quarantine in terms of uh, seven days, uh, you can now go into a modified quarantine uh, workout. And those guys have been really good uh, in their modified quarantine. So uh, those guys are in great shape. When, when they get to the 14th day, they can hit the field running. Then it's just about technique and execution and things of that nature. The guys coming out of isolation, it's 10 days. They've got to go through their cardiac uh, workup. Um, then they'll, they'll go through on day 11, um, a conditioning, and then 50% of their practice on 12 and then 13 
about 75% of their practice. So um, we have been doing since Monday, some form of, uh, we did a team activity, conditioning activity on Monday. Um, Tuesday, we had a weight training. Wednesday, we had a uh, voluntary conditioning, which was met with uh, the entire team. Uh, today, we'll practice. Tomorrow, we'll practice. Saturday, we'll weight train. And then Sunday, uh, will be a, um, you know, a, a live scrimmage situation for us on Sunday. We'll move next to Eric Hansen of the South Bend Tribune. Hey, Brian. Um, how did the team respond to those team activities the past three days? Uh, and, and then also, did the pause affect players trying to come back from injuries, such as Kevin Austin, Kyle Hamilton, and Ben Skoranek? Yeah. Boy, this feels a lot better in terms of the questioning. I get a, an injury question from Eric Hansen. I just feels like we're getting kind of back into the groove a little bit. Um, the attitude's been awesome. Uh, our kids have been great. You know, they were hit with a, something that they didn't expect. Uh, and, and again, we had gone for such a long period of time without any setbacks. And um, they've handled this adversity, you know, quite well. Uh, the morale was high. Guys were excited about being back out there and conditioning. And they want to get back at it. So, um, you know, the energy is high. The morale is excellent. Um, guys know that, uh, you know, there, there, there can't be, you know, any margin for error. Um, and, and they'll, they'll, they'll follow that up as it relates to the injuries. Uh, Kevin Austin, um, is in a running program right now. He ran the last couple of days. He'll be modified, um, over the next few days with, with practice, but, um, Right now, we're on track for him to um, to compete uh, against Florida State. Um, Hamilton is is uh, in great shape right now. I think uh, you know we expect him to be at, at full go. And uh, same thing with Ben. Ben looked uh, really, really good running, and he's you know feeling no effects from from the hamstring. So in all three of those instances, uh, you know we expect them to be you know at at uh, you know, obviously Kevin's going to be the guy that we modify for Florida State, but the other two guys should be, you know, at the uh, top of their, their form in terms of what they're capable of doing. We'll move next to Patrick Engel of Blue and Gold Illustrated. Hi, Brian. Um, when you've uh, talked in the past about, or I believe the other day you said that uh, on-field spread thinking is a, a pretty minimal risk. What have you learned and has kind of given you the confidence that, that that hasn't really been an issue or seemingly hasn't been something that's been an issue across college football? Well, I don't know that I use the word minimal risk. Uh, all that I said was that that based upon our uh, spike, uh, and and I think Rob kind of went into this in terms of maybe through our contact tracing, there could have been a few more that were symptomatic. You know, we played South Florida and in our constant communication with South Florida, they, they did not have any positives. So as it relates to, uh, you know, certainly the on-field spread in that instance, when you have one team that, that is clearly, even though we tested on Friday night, uh, you know, there, there, there was some, obviously a chance there that that could have spread and it did not. And so I think that uh, the way the game is played where there is not, um, you know, the uh, duration uh, of, of contact uh, over a long period of time, um, it minimizes the spread. It, it appears at least that way. Again, I'm not an expert in, in this. All we're doing is we're picking up a lot of these trends as we see them and, that seems to be the case right now. Um, you know, <laughs> stay tuned, right? And we'll see, we'll see what happens. Uh, but it allows you to look inwardly a lot more and, and really look at your procedures and practices and, and how you can fine tune them and, and drill even deeper on um, taking care of yourself instead of having to worry so much about the other team or what else is going on. That would make this almost untenable. Uh, if, if you were worried about on-field spread for every game as well. I guess that's what I'm saying in a nutshell. 
We'll move next to Pete Sampson of The Athletic. Brian, I was curious, I, this is going to sound like I'm asking you for a specific number, and I'm not, but if you have seven players in Q&I and you can play against South Florida and you have 39 for Wake Forest and don't, like, where is the sliding scale of what, you know, what you can manage? And does that change at all now that essentially the slack in your schedule has been reduced with Wake Forest now being played in December on that uh, flex week for the ACC? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, I, I think really what you're looking at is where are you in the handling of the outbreak? In other words, has, has your testing um, gotten it to the point where you have a handle on it and you know that you don't have any more spread, that, that you have a clear handle on it? I think that's, that's part one. Part two then becomes – can you put together a team um, that is um, at, at least resembling in, in some fashion um, the competitiveness of your group? Uh, if you're missing, you know, uh, two quarterbacks or if you don't have uh, a full offensive line, uh, if you have no rotation uh, at a defensive line, if you're at critical positions where – where it then becomes something that you have to play a singular defensive line, the entire uh, player, the entire game, then you're putting a player at risk. And, and I think that that's kind of how we needed to look at it is first, do we have this under control? We didn't feel like through our testing that we, we had the spike under control yet. That was number one. And then number two, would we be risking a particular individual by playing them well beyond the threshold of the amount of plays that they should be playing in a game? That was, that was part two. And when we looked at one and two, that's how we made our decision. Moving forward, um, certainly we're in a different place um, and, and we don't have the kind of luxury that we did earlier, but we'll still have to use both of those um, as we evaluate if something happens further. And we'll end this afternoon with Doug Farmer of NBCSports.com. Ryan, you mentioned how diff difficult and different this is bringing back the whole team. Have you or anyone on your staff talked with any programs who've already gone through such a three week layoff or a few ACC schools come to mind, but obviously there's a number of programs across the country. Well, nobody's played two games and then taken two weeks off. I, so this will be uncharted territory um, from that perspective. Like I said, I mean, you know, it's different than, than, you know, preparing and, you know, being in camp and just hitting each other and then going and playing the game. That's the game of speed. The speed is different. Uh, and, and you kind of, you got to kind of work through that. Right. Um, you know, these guys have played the game. They know what they know what the speed is. They know what they need to be ready for uh, tackling things of that nature. You know, we're going to have to go against each other and have, we're going to have to go live, you know. So there's going to have to be a little bit of, you know, bowl game preparation here, if you will. Um, but, you know, two weeks is not two months. And it's not like we're, you know, we haven't been doing it um, for, for two months. So, um yeah, there'll be some challenges, but, um, you know, I, I think once the game gets going, uh, this group is, uh, has played a lot of football. Uh, I'm pretty confident we'll be able to get up to snuff pretty quickly. All right, and we will end it with that. Thank you very much, Coach, for your time. My pleasure. Thank you.